Hello, this is Dr. Carlo Oyer, emergency physician and the founder of this new page, EDXit Video Pro, meant for the healthcare professionals who like to watch my channel. I'm doing a split of my regular procedural vignette videos versus my quality medical education, really meant for people interested in learning medicine. So my very first video is going to be uh, questions and answers from a YouTube subscriber. Musan Durakovic writes, Hello, Dr. Oger. I am an NP nurse practitioner working in the ER and doing this research that my director recommended a topic for our monthly meeting, who needs blood cultures order in the ED. I guess we uh, in our department order too many blood cultures. Just wondering if you have any suggestions or criteria in your ER. Thanks. So yeah, I have a lot of information on that actually. Uh, first, let's start with a little bit of background. Although it is common to order blood cultures in the emergency department, there is little evidence as to whom actually needs it. So this is a very, very good question and one worthwhile asking and answering. Approximately 200,000 episodes of bacteremia occur in the United States each year with an incident of about 10 uh, per 1,000 hospital admission. Bacterial bloodstream infections, or BSIs, are associated with a mortality between 14 to 37 <clears> percent. <throat> mortality is especially high in critically ill patients admitted to the intensive care units, where excess mortality of 35 percent or more is attributable to bloodstream infections. Because of the high mortality associated with bacteria, the dangers of undertreating some infections or concerns about inappropriate use of antibiotics, physicians tend to order blood cultures liberally. As a result, only 4 to 7 percent of blood cultures drawn are positive. That means that the other 93 percent are wasted and unnecessary, quote unquote. So, if that is true, and uh, yeah, the downside you're ordering a whole bunch of them, but there's an increase of mortality and morbidity very, very high if you don't order them, then let's order them on everybody. Well, not really, because you end up with false positive blood cultures, which results in 50% increase in total charges to the patient and a 64% increase in the median length of stay compared to negative blood cultures patients. I mean, if there was nothing wrong with them, but the blood culture is positive, now they stay longer in the hospital and they get more testing and more costs. So that's why we shouldn't be doing them on everybody. So what are the indications for blood cultures? Blood cultures should be obtained prior to the initiation of antimicrobial therapy for any patient whom there is suspicion of bacteremia or fungemia, including hospitalized patients and selected outpatients with fever, elevated white count or leukocytosis or leukopenia. Low blood counts can be a sign of infection. However, a normal white blood cell count does not rule out bacteremia. Circumstances in which blood cultures are especially important include known or suspected sepsis, meningitis, osteomyelitis, arthritis, endocarditis, peritonitis, pneumonia, and fever of unknown origin. So let's look at this article in the Journal of Emergency Medicine, Who Needs a Blood Culture? A prospectively derived and validated prediction rule. So really everything you need to know is in this slide right here. And uh, I couldn't really do a good uh, enough explanation of this slide. But what essentially it says is a prospective study that figured out a, a prediction rule that was then subsequently validated. So this answers the question you just asked me. Uh, it's a study, they did a whole bunch of patients to try to find true bacteremia rates. Uh, decision rule was created with major criteria. The finest temperature more than 103 degrees Fahrenheit, dual and vascular catheter, suspicion of endocarditis, and then minor criteria. Uh, that are listed there, bandemia, low platelets, creatinine elevation, and so on. A blood culture is indicated by the rule if at least one major criterion or two minor criteria are present. That's the people who you would order the blood cultures on. Otherwise, the patients are classified low risk and cultures can be skipped. Only 4% of low risk patients in the derivation set and 3 low risk patients in the validation had positive cultures. The sensitivity was 98%. And, uh, and, and then you can see the confidence intervals were very, very good. So it is a promising clinical decision rule for predicting bacteremia in patients with suspected infection. So if you use this idea of major or minor criteria to determine who needs a blood culture, you're probably going to order culture the people that you really need it.
This is another article. This one from a different um, uh, literature, but this one is a Shapiro review. It's a, another prediction rule that combines not only the major or minor criteria, but also the use of um, procalcitonin. Here is listed the major or minor criteria, just like we did in two slides ago. According to the decision rule, blood culture is indicated if at least one major criteria or two minor are present. Fewer than one person who did not meet any of the criteria had positive blood cultures. In the validation group, the rule had a sensitivity of 97%, a specificity of 29%, a positive predictive value of 11%, negative predictive value of 99%. This use of these rules can decrease blood culture utilization by 27%. Now, if you combine the Shapiro rule of one major and two minor criteria with the procalcitonin levels, that even increases your sensitivity and decreases your false positives, false negatives, and everything else. There's a lot of literature and a lot of numbers to discuss, and I'm not really going to go through all that. But essentially, you're using two different rules and a blood test and a level of blood test to tell you how likely it is that infection is present, and therefore you should get blood culture. Essentially, the higher the procalcitonin level, the higher the risk of severe infection, and you should be um, uh, doing the blood cultures on. But now, let's talk about what happens in real life. So what happens in real life, and who should you really get antibiotics? Well, let me tell you about the sepsis bundle. And this is a core measure that is a CMS initiative, and if you don't do it right, uh, you're going to end up in trouble with core measure failures, which then is tied and linked to um, reimbursement. So if you don't do this right, you're going to end up uh, losing a lot of reimbursement and you get in trouble with the hospital and staff and the public uh, reportable reports of the hospital metrics and things like that. So what happens is this, if a patient meets SIRS criteria, that's inflammatory response with a tachycardia, tachypnea fever, has a white count elevation or low white count, and they have a source of infection, then they're going to meet sepsis. And they have sepsis, and you're going to give any parenteral antibiotics in our practice. Before you give parenteral antibiotics in our department, you have to get blood cultures. We know the yield's going to be very low, and we know we're going to be owning cultures in people who are never going to be positive. The problem is, if you give the antibiotics before the culture, boom, core measure failure. Whether it's literature-based, evidence-based medicine, correct thing or the wrong thing to do, sadly, we have to do this. So as people come in with simple cellulitis, we know the likelihood of uh, blood cultures being positive very, very low, and you can actually culture a wound. Why would you need blood cultures? But you have to do them if you're admitted to the hospital with IBM bus. Now, if they're going home, that's different. You don't have to get them because you do not fall in the core measure because that only applies to patients that are hospitalized. So although evidence-based medicine says, you know, this patient has a low likelihood of bacteremia, you still have to get that blood culture. So we have actually put out a blanket rule that if you're going to give IV antibiotics, you have to get blood cultures first, which leads to a lot of blood cultures and probably false positives and people coming back for rechecks and reevaluations, which is not the right thing to do clinically, but it is on a practice guideline. So if your medical director doesn't know about the sepsis bundle and things like that, then you got to get it. So for pneumonia, cellulitis, uh, UTIs, I mean, UTIs, you, you have the urine culture. Why would you need a blood culture? But the problem is if you're going to admit them without the antibiotics, you need the blood culture. And the other thing is if you admit them without the cultures, the hospitals are going to get peed off and the consultants because you didn't do it and things like that. So you just basically end up doing something because that's what you're expected to do and not because it's the right thing to do. So hopefully that answer your question. That tells you what we do as a department, what I do in my own practice. And sadly enough, it's not the answer you want to hear because we know all the data. We discussed in the previous uh, slides that shows that if you use a good decision clinical rule, you don't have to order the blood culture. However, the admissioning doctors, the consultants, don't know that literature. They don't follow that literature. They're going to be like, you should have got me my blood culture, and you didn't. So you're going to have to do it. All right? Thank you for your questions. I hope you like this video and that you learn a lot. And let me know how it goes in your presentation to the rest of the department.